or fulfilling about 200 wishes a week. And to kind of put that in perspective of our 37 year history, we have now welcomed 185,000 families uh, for their dream trip here to Walt Disney World. So, and your ticket purchase tonight is making that possible for us. Through the ticket sales, through the auction in the back, through the gift shop back there, we've been able to fulfill five wishes for families. And that's something to be incredibly proud about. This is the first of many more speaker series, so people look out on our calendar, on our website, social media, to see what's coming up next. But if you guys don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from uh, Tony Baxter and Jason Sorrell, so give them a round of applause. Hello everyone, how you doing? Good. Now this event was originally supposed to take place last fall, but we had a tropical storm. So there was lots of water in, in. Lots of water and flooding, so we said we're gonna move into April, where there's not gonna be any water for three months on either side of the drought and And no heat. And no, yeah, no heat, it's been very, very uh, temperate. Um, but it's my honor and privilege to host uh, Tony Baxter, Disney legend, Walt Disney Imagineer. He's uh, a mentor figure for me, been very prominent in, in my career, so it's a, a, an honor for me to, to moderate this talk, and, and you guys are in for some great stories and some great insights. So, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Baxter. Thank you, Jason. My partner in crime and writer of the many many books. He's done so many books on the mountains of Disney and the Haunted Mansion. And he wrote the afterword for the Disney Mountains. Yeah. And, and by the way, all those hands that went up that said they had never been uh, to an event here before at the village, I got a fabulous tour this afternoon, and this is like its own theme park. It's beautifully done, and many of the uh, vendors for theme parks and actual theme parks themselves, like Disney and Universal, uh, have contributed to build these things, and when you walk around, it's a jaw drop. Uh, it looks a lot like one of my favorite parks in Europe called uh, Efteling in Holland, and what I was describing at playing is, well, yeah, because they've been working with us on this and we've been working with them. So things that were created here to help children enjoy that can't uh, access things as easily as other people can, uh, have transformed uh, out to other parks and they've brought some of their incredible creations here for these kids to enjoy. So it's a spectacular thing and it's the biggest Disney World from what I understand, the Magic Kingdom is about the same size. Yeah, so. It was a fun afternoon, anyway. My theme park adventure. So it's big, as big as the Imagine Kingdom, but it's easier to get into the restaurants here. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna kind of go back, back to um, the start for me, which was down here. I was thinking I came here in April of 1971. First plane flight, you know, in my life, because I was 22 years old. Uh, and they were so desperate, they needed 22-year-olds to help build Walt Disney World. You know? <laughs> so imagine that. When people come up to me today and say, how do you get in here? Uh, I was lucky. I was really lucky that that happened. And getting that year down here in Florida to build, uh, it transformed me from a little kid who built models to someone who knew how to actually sculpt mountains and build the submarine ride uh, that was here at that time. So that was... My beginning, and I was thinking about that this, this was the month that I came down here. I knew I was in a different world, because in California, if they handed you an envelope with keys in it, it would be crispy, you know, and you'd crackle it open, and, and there are the keys. And here they handed me what felt like a, a piece of cloth that was an envelope, and it just sort of, the, the, the flap just mushed off, you know, and there was the key inside of it to my apartment. And I said, I'm not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> anyway, so. Well, you, and your Disney beginning goes even before that, because you actually worked in Disneyland and ice cream, yeah, as an ice cream yeah, server, yeah. and you actually met. I did. Um, I started a year before Walt Disney passed away. And uh, of course, we weren't on, you know, Walt wanted everyone on a first name basis, and if you could read your name tag, he would call you Tony. Uh, but you couldn't have a, intelligent conversation with him because he was there and you were there. Uh, but I remember I was gonna tell him all about not hiring enough people at Carnation to scoop ice cream and they were making it look like we were fully staffed when we weren't, you know, so he, we knew he was coming over to look at the place. 
So we put everyone on the windows. So many Baxter whistleblowers. Yeah. <laughs> and they should have been on breaks. They should have been at lunch. They were all tired. And Walt was like an hour late. So everyone was overworked. And I was going to say, Mr. Disney, you need to understand that we couldn't, we don't have the staff to open all this. It's just to make it look good for you. And then he came. And I, you know, your heart is pounding and he's getting closer and closer. And then and he says, so how are things going here, Tony? And then I said, just fine. <laughs> that was my moment. Oh, good, good. I'm so glad to hear it. And it's over. Yeah, that's... Anyway, so. And after he's like, stupid Tony, stupid Tony. Yeah, of course. For five years I did that. Well, I, we never thought there'd be Disney after Walt. Um, that was a big, you know, concern. Is, is it going to go on? And uh, I stopped, actually, my schooling uh, projects that were all aimed at portfolio for here. And uh, it took me six months to get back into, well, maybe there is going to be something after Disney. And uh, I was very lucky to get there at the time when they hadn't really, you know, put a thought to that. These guys were all the same age as Walter, or maybe five years younger. And all of a sudden they, they realized, well, if Walt's gone, we're not going to be around here for much longer. So we need to start hiring new people. And I got, I used to say, it's kind of silly now, but I used to say I'm a, oldest of the younger generation of Imagineers now, and probably the oldest of the, whatever, uh, the office of it. But anyway, so that, so we're here to talk about Big Thunder tonight, and for those of you that are going to make two rounds of this, we'll be back for an encore tomorrow, talking about our friend Figment and turning into imagination. So, shall we get started on this, going back to why is there a frontier land at Disneyland even? Um, you younger people might not understand that. But here's a look at what American popular mythology was about when Disneyland opened. Now these are all Disney products that you're seeing up there in the posters. Probably a lot of you have seen these. But we're going to give you a rundown now of, you know, how many can name these films. But in the 50s and early 60s, the Western was what a Marvel movie is today. And uh, I'm sure some of your older people are going, oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, but this was a weekly look at what television was about in the time that Disneyland was created. And uh, so Frontierland, in both Disney World and Disneyland, occupies over a third of the park for one land. And you go, well, why would you spend so much time on that? And obviously it was because that is where the Star Wars, the Marvel, uh, the mythology of the 50s and 60s was. It keeps going. Yeah, it keeps going. Because let's see, are we up to? Are we are up to ours. Yeah. Well, it is interesting though when you think of all the real estate that we devote today to things like Star Wars and Marvel and Harry Potter and Cars and it, the Western really was the, the comic book film of, of an earlier era. Yeah, and it was a little easier. I mean, now it's okay to shoot an alien, but it, you know, at that time, you know, it was cowboys and Indians, and anything went, but. We have a little bit more sensitivity today about that, so these things don't happen. So we're going to go back to what preceded me was a big concept here you see in this painting called Thunder Mesa. And uh, we're going to give you a quick little look here at a the ride that was inside, which was like Pirates of the Caribbean, but with cowboys and Indians. So here's a brief look at what would have been the Western River Expedition at Walt Disney World. Um, and that was originally came about because Mark Davis and others didn't necessarily want to repeat Pirates of the Caribbean because the thinking was Florida is so close to the real Caribbean and has real pirate lore so people aren't going to be interested. So this was envisioned to be the substitute for pirates. Yeah. Uh, the, the thought being, let's bring New Orleans and the Gulf Coast to California with pirates and then we'll bring the American West down here. And also there's a even more, I think, affinity in Florida because Bear Bands has always been really comfortable here, whereas it kind of died in California. And you know, we had two theaters. You only have one down here. We had two, and they had to close one immediately. You know, and then the other one would run sporadically. So uh, it's now Winnie the Pooh, sadly. But uh, you still have Country Bear down here. Um, and this was really a, a passion project of, of Mark Davis. Yes. 
Mark and uh, if you look at the mountains in the rear of that shot right now, that is Mary Blair, famed uh, animator, who did the color styling for it. And they thought it could be a little more cartoony than um, what they did with Pirates of the Caribbean, which was more realistic. So there was definitely a color palette and a stylization to this that um, is a bit different. And this wound up ultimately going away because the, the public decided they wanted pirates. pirates yes. Shortly after opening, after seeing it on the Sunday night show, no one could understand why they didn't get pirates here. So shortly after opening, cast members started wearing the buttons that said, the pirates are coming. Yeah. In December of 1973. Who, who would have thought? I mean, they had a big television show about Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. So Walt Disney World opens, and nobody could have expected it. All the guests that were shown that across the United States would say, oh, well, don't go to the Florida one because they don't have that great new ride, that pirate ride. So the combination of the sensitivity, I think, for the Native American culture and the fact that the people that came to Florida or didn't come and went to Disneyland wanted pirates. So uh, that sort of was the beginning of the end. Not the final end, because it kept going for a while, but we're gonna... And we don't, we don't want to stir up trouble between the Mark Davis estate and Pixar, yeah. but just so. Say. Yeah, so <laughs> many years later, you know, the immensity of that Thunder Mesa, we could, I just looked at it and said, can you even believe that Disney could ever build anything like that? That's just off the charts. But then, you know, cut to California Adventure, and they actually did. So if you've been out to California and seen Cars Land, um, it, for every intents and purpose, looks like the same immense Mesa structure that was originally designed for. Well, when you pointed it out last night, because you know, I had the same reaction, I'm like, who could imagine something as elaborate as Thunder Mesa? And then Tony brought up the picture, I'm like, oh. <laughs> that, that, that really is what it would have looked and felt like from essentially Splash Mountain all the way over to... Yeah, because, you know, we always say no good ideas really die. They just go on the shelf for a while. So, you know, when this came out, I mean, if you walk through that area, it absolutely looks like um, you were in Monument Valley. So let's go back to 1974 and when we started thinking about Big Thunder. We knew we couldn't afford to do that back then. It was a question mark whether Walt Disney World would even be successful. And they were spending big money to do a pirate ride already. So I had to find something that was small and kind of looked like that. So I found a view in Monument Valley. And here you can see that inspiration in the one photo and then Disney World in the other. Now, I was not an artist at the time. I was a model builder. So I wasn't allowed to do paintings. I was only allowed to build models. So I got a little, you know, six by nine pad. And with a pencil, I just drew a very tentative thing, saying, well, we could kind of maybe, if you really didn't, you know, and it was sort of like, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, why don't we look at uh, taking that up a little bit more? So then kind of a rough draw, uh, painting here was done of um, what this might look like, uh, based on my horrible little drawing. And then they said, well, look, I think you should build a small model of it so we can see it. So. Uh, Just we, a small model. Yeah, it, well, if you're if you're walking around in this model, you'd be about you know five sixteenths, as it's called a twentieth scale. So one inch equals twenty feet. Um, but what if you look carefully at this? I was very sensitive. I was worried that Mark Davis would be very upset if suddenly Western River Ride was gone. So that big brown area in the back. Uh, does your pointer work? I don't know. They can probably see it. Uh, but that big brown building with the Cars Land facade on it, that is the Western River Run. So it was always thought, we'll build what we can afford now, because there was nothing in Frontierland but country bears. So this gave us an attraction out of the, the furthest point, and then we'll come back and then do Western River. So this model was very convincing in changing me from being a model builder to being someone involved with my mentor here was Claude Coates, the older man in the foreground, and Dave Schweninger. Dave Schwinninger is an engineer on the project, and the kid just back from his 22-year-old. So I was probably at 24 now, and didn't have the mustache, so that was done to make me look at 34. Instead of um, Not to pivot too much from Big Thunder, but you have a, an amazing sort of origin story with Claude Coates, who would go on to be your mentor. But yeah, I do. Um, how you first met him. Far before, um, you know, working in Imagineering, scooping ice cream. 
uh, I was kind of a, a naughty kid down there if I could sneak into something. And they were building this pirate ride. And our cafeteria, for those of you who are a Disney fan, was called The Pit. And it was down under the Blue Bayou, but above the jail scene in Pirates. And there was a stairway to evacuate people eventually that went down from the cafeteria to the jail scene. So we're going back from lunch and I said, I'm just gonna walk down that stairway and see what I can see. And I got to the bottom. The fire and all that had been turned on in the prison and so all the crackling fire and the, and the figures were there moving and um, I'm peeking further and further to see what else I can. And this voice says, you can't see very well from there. Why don't you jump down into the dry track and I'll show it to you. And I looked back up the stairway and I said, goodbye, tell them I'll be back later. You know, got docked an hour's pay for that. But it, this guy gives me this incredible tour. And it turned out many years later when I worked in Imagineering, I was looking at my pirate souvenir book and I'd always remembered, there's the guy that took me on his tour. But I'd never put together that it was the guy I now work with at Imagineering. And so I could hardly wait to go in the next day and say, remember the red and white candy stripe outfit guy that you took on the pirate tour? And he goes, yeah, I think I do. He, he always gave me ice cream and he's a nice guy. And, I go, and then he looked at me and goes, oh my God, it's you. <laughs> and so that kind of turned us, our relationship from mentor and not slave, but you know, and team. Apprentice, <laughs> apprentice. Yeah, apprentice. Um, into a, a friendship that lasted till Claude's passing. Well, it also shows you that sort of a spirit of wanting to share and wanting to yeah. enlighten and, and, and say, sure no, to remind me tomorrow when we get to Disneyland. Um, no, we'll be here tonight. Let's see. And we do Disneyland Paris in this way. When we get to Disneyland Paris, remind me to do a clock story. Yeah. If you folks could remind me. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you, you got me derailed here, and I'll derail us again with another clock. It's not a story. competition. Meanwhile, back at Big Thunder, we're going to go on now from. This, this is, is a, a lovely story, and I stand yeah. by that. And it'll be an even more touching story, the other one, if you get me to say it. Okay, so we're back here. This is a Grace, quarter. Grace, remind me to remind Tony. Okay, thank you. This is a quarter inch model, so now if you're walking around on this model, you'd be an inch and a half tall. And uh, it really begins to let us see and understand exactly what we're gonna have to build. And uh, people would sometimes say to me, do you really think people are gonna see and understand something like the next one, which is the flash flood um, from that train ride? I said, absolutely not. They're not gonna be able to understand anything that's going on about that guy floating down the water in the bathtub. And then, well, why are we doing it? I said, because have you ever noticed there's a train that runs around this park? called the Walt Disney World Railroad, and they don't see anything, you know? And I said, they will be able to see this and experience a part of Big Thunder, especially if they are not inclined to ride a roller coaster, they'll be able to get a big scene, and we can do a narrative on, the, on board the train for that scene. And then the vehicle going through, the Big Thunder train to go through it, actually becomes a part of telling that story. And what's interesting about that is it, it also contributes to the ride itself, even though the intent was to have something for the train, but the, to the guests on Big Thunder, this would be yet another example of just an abundance of detail yeah. and storytelling. Importance of models, which is a good thing to talk about as we show you a painting. I'll go back. Uh, <laughs> it is that you can move around them and get a really great sense of what it's actually physically going to be. And we do do and use we do use computer generated CG models with heads up, you know, sets to now do some of this, but it's still not as, I know, tactile as being able to build a model and move things around quickly. And um, so models in both forms are used even today. Um, but I'll take you through how some of that's changed as we get into the process of building Big Thunder because it was during the building of Big Thunder that the computer took over. It was sort of in its infancy for Space Mountain down here, and then it came to full fruition when we built Big Thunder. Okay, so we're going to a painting, even though models are important, so are painting. Paintings are more valuable for selling a project. So if you're out there trying to get a sponsor or uh, explain to the board of directors why we're spending this money in Florida, uh, paintings are great. And so 
we were on a roll. We thought this is a home run. There's nothing. It's an eco economical way to get something out where the Western River Road is going. Absolutely nothing can go wrong. But George uh, Lucas came along. Yeah, and so the space program. This is like the late, um, you know, early mid mid seventies, uh, and people were obsessed with going to the moon and all of that. So they dug out and resurrected Walt Disney's original concepts for Space Mountain at Disneyland. And Florida said, people are coming in droves to Cape Canaveral and Cape Kennedy for the space launches. So we definitely need to have something that plays off that. So Big Thunder went on the shelf <laughs> and we opened Walt Disney World Space Mountain. And space Mountain was not a new idea. It no, it actually went back to Walt. It, Walt presented that in the LA Times and a year before he passed away for Disneyland, because Disney World didn't exist. Um, but anyway, so that was crushing. But, like, all good stories have a good ending here, so we'll go forward. This is back in California. This piece, when I was a little kid, was on a board fence in front of this area in Frontierland, and it said, coming soon, you know, this whole area, Rainbow Ridge, um, the stagecoaches, all of these great rides and this thing called Rainbow Caverns that was um, another Claude story. Walt wanted a cavern that had every rainbow color of water in it, all done with black light. And, uh, and none of it would mix. They would all stay pure red and pure green and pure blue and all that. And the engineers came in and gave a big you know, discussion about how this is impossible, it'll never work. And then Walt would tap, and he raised his eyebrow, and he said, well, does anyone here in Imagineering think that it could work? And Claude says, well, yeah, I think I could build it. And he goes, you are in charge of the project. <laughs> so Claude came up with those toughy pads that you clean the junk off of your pans with that are all bubbly kind of foam. And when the water fell into that, it didn't splatter. So the, 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 the pools of different colors didn't mix when the sprays would come down, they went into the pads and were stayed pure. So Rainbow Caverns was an amazing thing. So as a child, I grew up with the four major attractions here. Uh, the stagecoaches, the Conestoga wagons, and the uh, mules, which was hard to believe we actually could ride animals at Disneyland, but it was a great ride. It was an e-ticket. And the mules would go towards the edge of the cliff sometimes, and it was actually pretty scary. And then uh, they had fighting elks uh, that were automatronic, and where they positioned them, they spooked the mules. So there's a big fight of these two mules. Uh, big... So they had to move the elks to the other side so they weren't a problem. But sadly, one by one, these uh, started to drift away. So the first to go was um, the stagecoaches, because actually one of them, they were very top heavy if you had a lot of big people on the top. And you can guess the rest of it. Uh, so then we were left with just the Conestoga way while into the 70s. But then, you know, you were dealing with an ordinary animal and they went away. So all we had left was the little mine train. And uh, people weren't going there because it was a slow, it was a very peaceful ride and, and fun because we had this incredible rainbow cavern thing that Claude did at the end of it. But um, eventually it was time war and people were saying, what about that thing the 22-year-old kid did for Walt Disney World? Could we maybe, while they're having their joy with their Splash Mountain, maybe we could do one of those. So they said, draw another picture of how that would fit, not over where it is in Florida, but on the side that's right next to the Fantasyland Castle. Because you couldn't just yeah. lift it as now. We had a haunted mansion. Our haunted mansion is over where your Big Thunder is. And Disneyland's Big Thunder is where your mind mansion is, so it's flipped. That means all the drawings had to be put in the blueprint backwards, you know, when we flipped it. But anyway, so I did that sketch, and then I realized because it was next to Fantasyland, I needed to go back to nature and find something that worked as a backing piece to Snow White and, and everything. So we weren't allowed to go on trips those days, like a certain guy that did the Animal Kingdom that went all the way. But I, so they said, you know what he's talking about, Joe. I didn't say that. Um, so they said, we've got a great idea for you. We have a great library of National Geographic up in the library. Why don't you just go down there and get out all the National Park books? Uh, so I did, and I opened the one on Bryce Canyon. 
And the first line in that article uh, was, when you reach the rim of the canyon at Bryce, you'll be looking at something that was crafted, you would think, by Walt Disney. <laughs> so I said, that settles it. Of course, now we own National Geographic. Too. Uh, <laughs> isn't it funny how the world changes? So anyway, I, I got- It takes less list. time to talk about the things Disney doesn't own. Yeah, right. So uh, that became the basis of the Disneyland version. So that meant I got to go back and make another model because it had to be backwards from the one that we did for Walt Disney World and uh, also accommodate the fact that where that flash flood was designed for your park railroad at Walt Disney World, we are right up against the Pinocchio ride. You know, so we not only had the problem of no view from a train ride, but we had to hide the view of the back warehouse building that is Pinocchio by putting you in a thing we call Coyote Canyon, which is a little bit of a thrill that you get at Disneyland at that point that isn't in the, the ride down here. So they both have their eccentricities. And it, it's interesting that the, the Bryce Canyon look is more whimsical, but also it feels better in, in the compressed footprint, whereas here in Florida you have that sort of epic landscape of Monument Valley because you have more space to work with. As Actually, well. that leads into another thing that I've used to identify how we build something for the different parks. And uh, pretty much I'll discount uh, Tokyo because it's kind of a clone of Walt Disney World. But, you know, Monument Valley works so well down here because Walt Disney World is spectacular. The charming nature of Bryce Canyon works at Disneyland because Disneyland is the most charming park of them all. And it works in Florida, in, in Paris, it's beautiful, which you'll see later, uh, because everything in the Paris park, Magic Kingdom, is so much more beautiful than our other parks. So that, whenever I was involved in doing something, I would sort of set the beginning first day on, it has to fulfill spectacular, charming, or beautiful. Um, now we will go back to our previous schedule program, which is the so here are a few shots of that model. Uh, and it was really fun to have not built one Big Thunder yet and already been building a second variation on the model, you know, with a whole different look. Um, and reversed. And it, it actually worked pretty well in reverse. So about this time they said, so what do you see in this thing? If, you know, you've done, like, is it just a roller coaster? Because I think Six Flags up in uh, Atlanta had the, the oh, Butcher, this the Galanica uh, mine, mine train ride, yeah. And they said, is it like that where you don't see anything? And I said, no, we'd see something. Well, what do you see? So not being the artist, I did a quick drawing and then I had to figure out how to paint it. And I showed this finale scene, you know, for the uh, avalanche at the end of it. And so they said, okay, this is starting to feel like a Disney. Traction. And none of the guests are facing the camera because... I can't paint people. You know, so <laughs> the re-rendering re I do will be, everyone's turned away, you know, so. Um, so this kind of got us to the point where they said, okay, we're going to put some R&D funding into doing this. So they actually built a test track out in back of Imagineering. And so we could go up the hill and go down the hill and um, kind of start to feel what the capacity would be like. and cars you need to make that and so forth. So it was getting serious now, all because of Disneyland, which ironically, we had built it for Florida, now is Disneyland. So here you see two models in the foreground is Chris Runko, who ultimately built Rex, the pilot for the original Star Wars ride, and he's now in the cantina uh, in Galaxy's Edge. Um, he, can't, he designed that character. Uh, he's doing the steel model, which is at a quarter inch scale, and behind that, that enormous pile of foam is the inch scale model that would be used in the next element, which was this field of, um, these are foot grids, and they represent, each one of those squares is one inch on that inch scale model. And so all the steel was built, you can see steel laying down there, uh, and so it was bent as per that inch scale model. And then in the next one, you can see it being assembled into these cages, we call them. They look like kind of bent up bird cages and bent with pencil rod and steel and then covered with metal lath. And then each of these cages had a number on it and they were stacked up based on their number. And that's how you get 
I think the dis difference between Disney Stone and most of the other companies, I mean, Universal is getting smart now too, but um, the, the fact that your eyes have to buy reality and something that's artificial is that there's a consistency to the elements of nature in it. So the banding of rock work where it's more uh, fragile and more hard and all of that, that has to carry through the whole thing. And if you were making it as a sculpture, you'd, you'd lose sight of that. But by doing these in cages off the model, they all have numbers and they all line up. So the banding of the various layers is, is consistent. And this is all before, like today, this would all be done figured out digitally. Yeah. Yeah. But back then, it, had, it was much more analog and had yeah. kind of a DIY quality. So, all right, so now we move on to, it's starting to sh take shape. And I remember bringing my dad out here who grew up near the Sierra Mountains at the foot of them in, um, in California. And, you know, the fact that his son was building a mountain in Anaheim, uh, that kind of intrigued him about it because he wasn't a big Disneyland fan, but uh, I remember getting to take him out there while we were, we, we actually built that butte that you see on the top there on the ground. So we hadn't done a big thunder before, we didn't know, so we then lifted it up and put it in place, so he came out for that crowning, if you will, of the mountain. And it was an amazing day because it went from just a steel, you know, building that looked out there, and all of a sudden there was this thing that wasn't going to change from that point on, it was going to be that in Disneyland forever. Um, so, uh, pretty amazing. Impressive to be. What did that feel like that day as someone who grew up with Disneyland, I was, worked at Disneyland, and now you're literally changing the landscape of Disneyland? You're, you're always scared because what if it's awful? You know, there's always that thought. And I knew that there was a sweetness and gentleness to the original ride that we wouldn't have. It was going to be a coaster. And there was tremendous pressure to compete with the Magic Mountains and, you know, the, the Six Flags um, in that arena. We weren't, we weren't playing to that. And we didn't have. Uh, when we started this, we were still building Space Mountain. So all we had was the Matterhorn and the pirate prop, you know. So, yeah, it was fearful, and I didn't know what I was doing. So everything that we were, um, you know, that came along, we had to figure out. So, in fact, here's a really good example in the next slide. Um, we, how are we going to do a, a cavern, you know, with these stalactites? And Skip Lang, who is my partner in crime on this, we were thinking like, well, what looks truly and like, you know, and all that. And it's industrial enough that it would hold cement. You, a cake froster thing would fall apart. He's trying to squeeze out. So we thought, let's go over to Pep Boys and get a grease gun. <laughs> so in the next scene here, you can see the guy with the, the thing you grease your car with. And we went <laughs> and filled it up with cement and then gushed it out and let it dribble down the stalactites. And that's how we did it. But I mean, it, there wasn't a book you go to to find out how do you do that, you know, so you have to like invent it. And that, that's kind of the hallmark as well, because like I remember talking to Harriet Burns about the early days of, of Disneyland and uh, especially uh, doing the Tiki Room show. She would say things like, well, no one had ever built a Tiki Bird before, yeah. so we had to go down to the craft store and buy feathers. And it's just it, these weird solutions to things that have literally never been done before. And then once you do that, it's like, well, of course, everyone knows that's how you do it. You get a grease gun and you fill it with goop and make a stalactite. As one does. <laughs> and we have done from then on. Um, so it came out pretty good, actually. And so each of these things that you kind of ticked off, like, how are we going to do stalactites? There's no way. There's no book for it. There's, you know, if you tip the bucket over, it would, it would pour out. You couldn't get it over and onto the stalactite. And um, so now, when you finish each of these things, you go, no, oh, that came out pretty good. Maybe, maybe this is going to be okay. So the the fear factors start, you know, c going away with each element of it that looks pretty cool. I can't even tell what that next one. Oh, I was like, here, if anyone takes postcards and sells them to the park, give them the idea that you should take all of the pictures from where guests can't go because then they're going to buy them because you can't take them with your camera. Unless you're on TikTok, then you go wherever the hell you want. <laughs> but here's the thing, I mean, like this is down there in the ride watching the train go up, and it's, it's just fabulous. I would buy that postcard immediately because there's no way you could take it, you know, so just remember that. Um, so here we are, we got to the finish line, and uh, uh, it was, 
we had a, I think a, uh, we call it a strike in the middle of it and a few other things that delayed us from Disneyland's opening was on July 17th and we opened in September of that year due to a, a strike down at the park, but uh, it went really well. And so here's kind of a little uh, video recap of um, that time in my life. Welcome to 1979. <laughs> and uh, the publicity campaign, they did different ones for Walt Disney World and Disneyland. And so this is the Disneyland one. And it's, I think, even pre-VHS. So uh, be prepared to see what we had to look at on TV back then. No one knows what strange force has unleashed the runaway mind trains of the Big Thunder Mountain. But every day, Big Thunder strikes. <laughs> strikes. It will only happen at Disneyland. Not really. It happened somewhere else. <laughs> it's known as this kind of rollicking family ride and then that commercial's like let's get the guy who did Jaws yeah <laughs> scare the hell out of people so um, you know we opened and we renamed the little town there uh, Big Thunder uh, and a, a project like this is immense and it has an immensity to it and the next slide you can see looking down over the it's again on the opposite re uh, side of the river, right next to where your riverboat landing in the Phantom Man or Phantom Mansion would be here. Uh, but even though you know you undertake a project like this in the grand scale, and how does all of this take part in a, being a tapestry? When it opens, the guests find details, and they lock in on those details. <laughs> and if you haven't written the Disneyland version. We have a goat, and the goat is at the top of the second lift, and somehow everyone got wind of the fact that if you stared at the goat while you're yanked around this curve, it makes the ride about triple intense, you know, and so this, this became known as the goat trick, uh, and that riding the ride, half the people will be not looking at where they're going, but staring off to the right as the goat, as they encircle the goat. So. What, this was my first attraction, and I realized how important the details are, because unlike a movie where it's in the theater for a couple months, and then you buy a Blu-ray or watch it on uh, streaming, and then it's done. These things, people come back, and, and you ask, you have to ask yourself, why am I, or any of you, waiting in line an hour to go on something you've been on 20 times already, you know? Like, Peter Pan has been there since I was four, at Disneyland, and I can tell you right now, there's an, a, a 50 minute wait to go on that same ride. So there's something they're doing right in terms of being aspirational and giving details that are fun to enjoy over and over again. And a genius for doing that is uh, Pat Burke, who's in the next shot here. Pat, you tr he had an on and off switch, and you turned it on, and then came back after the ride was completely decorated. And every square inch of every big thunder that we have is due to Pat's understanding of mining detail, and uh, and they're all not only authentic pieces that he got from real you know mining sites, but they're in the right place. So if a piece was missing, he would build it so that you could actually crush the ore with this device and then and mine it and put it through the sluices and so forth. So uh, he was a genius that just made this whole army of big thunders uh, possible. And more than anyone, you knew how to wear a pair of slacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, leisure pants back then. Um, so here are just some of the details. And it's funny, I think that, cent is the center one of the buckets up there at the top? Yeah. So it's got the buckets going up and down. When they've recorded the, some of the soundtracks for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom on the Big Thunder at Disneyland, 
And so Ben Bird and all those guys were down there and I was talking with them. Goes, so in the mine car scene, you're yeah. actually hearing Big Thunder. Yeah, in that mine train, in the riot, there's some Big Thunder mixed in with that. So we're there and he's looking at it and said, I'm so glad you guys came up, you know, you, you found that because we're using that in the, in the scene in the mine too. And I said, oh really? And he said, yeah, yeah, we wanted to make it authentic and you know, you guys probably did the homework for us. I said, no, I stole it from the treehouse. <laughs> and then we suddenly realized we created a whole mythology about these devices. And I don't know if they ever, but they're really fun to look at, you know. So. And, you, and you were saying that all of this equipment is in the actual place it would be if this were a real Yeah, line. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yes, the way we have is Pat went to work and I said, I want one of those devices. So we did it. And then Pat Pepper built all of those sluices where the crushed stone comes up and it's washed down in those uh, things where the gold collects in the various uh, levels. So that part of it is real. But as far as whether they built those short round things or Swiss Family Treehouse things, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so we are also lucky that in the original show, I have this feeling like everything I've done, I tried to put something that Walt saw in it so that if he were to suddenly come back and he went there, it would be, oh, okay, I know where I am. This is uh, an extension of what we, we had here. And so the little town of Rainbow Ridge became Thunder, Big Thunder Town, the town of Big Thunder. But um, the buildings we were able to salvage. So these were there from 1956. Um, and we picked them up with a crane. The, the carpenters came in and rehabbed them all and they went back out and they've been there every day since in California. So that is a little different too from Walt Disney World because that's in the spot you have the geyser uh, country. Um, at the end of the ride here we have this little town. And in addition to the goat, there is another unsung hero a Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Yes. Uh oh, yes. Dal McKinnon. Now I don't know if this became a thing down here, but in California this year is the wildest ride in the wilderness became a catchphrase that even the one of our AM channels on the on the radio used it as their you know this year is the wildest radio station in the West you know and uh, so but you'll recognize his voice you can see all the roles he's done for us um, here at, at this now time. hang on to them hats and glasses because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness. So it's details, whether it's audio, and George Lucas was found fond of saying that uh, in a film, 50% of how much you remember about it is in the music and the audio. And so Dal really gave us that moment where that's one of those reasons why you wait to go on it again and again. You'd like to hear that in the second before you're gonna be dispatched. And so it's a rush to hear that. This here is the wildest, and then off you go. So. Um, that takes us now to moving across the nation back to back where you started. Where we started. And so well, one thing I was curious about is when you were doing Big Thunder for Disneyland, was uh, did you know the Walt Disney World version was going to come along eventually, or was there a period of uncertainty? No, I don't think it ever went back into um, it's not going to happen. Like uh, that was unfortunately true of Western River about this time we knew it probably wasn't going to happen because the pirate ride was such an immense, uh, they built that whole Caribbean plaza and all that. So they had been spending at that time a lot for what was coming in here. Um, so we were lucky to get this on the boards. And, and also because it was coming out well at Disneyland, uh, World didn't want to be jealous again and be the part where don't go there because they don't have that big thunder ride. So, um, you know, well, we were catching up by building Space Mountain after our Big Thunder, no, Big Thunder opened after Space Mountain, but, so we had Space Mountain, Big Thunder, Matterhorn, and, uh, and so they definitely didn't want to be left without uh, a Big Thunder, so and we went almost simultaneous. It was about a year later that uh, we did the same process that we, I showed you for building Disneyland. It was just replicated down here, but with a theme change back to the spectacular nature of Walt Disney World and making it uh, Monument Valley. So here is the uh, marketing art uh, for Walt Disney World, and I think we've got the same, the different trailer here for that too. Wow, wow. Three different structures, six thunder ovens, and 
The big finish for the opening show and 10 minute extravaganza completely ground shaking thunder machines. It was great as the mountain seemed to explode. The premise for the ride is that you're on a runaway train that plunges up and down and around and through a mine in the mountain. This time a lot stone collapses 22 months of work into a few seconds. And you can see the builder using the 6,500 tons of steel, 5,000 tons of semen and sand, 90,000 gallons of water, and 90,000 gallons of coal. <laughs> they used new technology to build Big Thunder, a model was made, then sectioned, and then a computer was used to figure out how to bend steel to create the shapes required. Covered in lath and gunite and semen and paint, it all comes out looking a lot like rocks. I remember looking at it as a model and wondering, I, I just wonder how the effects of that will be is big. I don't know, you don't get the impact until you're really here. Yeah. And it's, it's impressive for me. There are so much going on during the ride that you can't possibly see it all in one trip, which is the whole idea. I did more of a challenge to possibly see it in one trip for you. I kind of imagine the two in the world just in you know, the I love listening because you'll hear people uh, comparing notes with all of that. We'll be out and say, well, we can see the problem. Why do you see that? I saw this. Why do you see that? Let's go again. So it's kind of comfortable when we listen to the different things. Once the United States has taken their ride, it's time to open the big friends to the public. And there is no lack of people anxious to get the crafts. Well, I think you're wondering how many people will go Big Thunder Mountain, they know I counted them, and we came up with a number for you, up to 8,000. But seriously, judging from their comments, Big Thunder Mountain is a very big success. We'll have the parts next. How much cement was... <laughs> I've already forgotten. I apologize for that sound because it's not distorted like that, so it must have been we were trying to boost the sound. So my caution to you is when we get to the next sound, it might be loud again, so I don't know. So, here's an interesting fact, that other than how many pounds of cement and steel. Cement. This is the only mountain, to my knowledge, that's located on three continents. <laughs> um, and they say the fourth time is the charm. And so, one of the things that the first three share in common is they were the last thing to be built in the land in which they were added to. So that meant it was not a prime space. It was leftover space. But when we went to Paris, I thought, well, let's put it in the center, you know, so that, um, but isn't that where Tom Sawyer Island goes? And we found that in the European culture, Tom Sawyer and Mark Twain and whatnot is not as big a deal as here. So uh, we could reconfigure all of those adventures on Tom Sawyer Island to Treasure Island and make an adventure island over there that literally has the same caves and a bigger tree house because we've got the Swiss family tree house on that island. And uh, it worked out terrific to ship that there. And then the center of the waterway becomes the focal point of Big Thunder with all the boats and all the pedestrian traffic and everything going around that. Uh, so it, it's enlivening the entire atmosphere. And the other thing about the Europeans, they have a more purified view of the American West. Um, here it's everything from the Kentucky backwoods and forested areas and uh, the up in Washington, you know, the rainforest and all that. But in the West, it's gotten over there via John Wayne and John Ford and various other, it's Monument Valley. It's what they know from the yeah, movies. Yeah, the movies. And so 
the Marlboro Man was a huge uh, thing when we arrived in around the late seven, uh, late eighties. You know, it was still billboards everywhere, um, and so that whole idea of the rugged American West. So he said, let's purify this frontier land and do the whole land. And so it was kind of a great Colorado River with the Big Thunder being the monument in the middle of it. And so Tom Gillian did this first sketch uh, that depicted that. And then the next one is the reality of it. So it, it actually worked. Now the hard part was, it was actually an ulterior motivation of mine. I never liked the ending run out on Big Thunder because it's got to save some energy to get you out of the station and back into the ride for the next group. So you're sort of cheating people on that last run out. And uh, I said, how could we um, compensate for that? So by putting it out on the island, at the beginning of the ride, when you're expecting just to go down into the back cave and then be lifted up, this thing's got to dive under the rivers of America, you know? So like, you move out of the station and then it dives down like 25 feet and you're right, the second you leave the station, you're in full uh, blow, you know, screaming and yelling. But on the way back, you're already going at a clip and it goes into the snow shed where we normally just start to slow down and go into the ending. And instead, it's got to dive down and we hit the fastest speed on any ride in any park that we've ever done. Maybe uh, Guardians or something would exceed that, but I don't think at the time it was uh, full tilt and pitch black, you know, down at the bottom of this thing. And uh, when people pop out back on the street side, you know, because the ride is all out in the middle of the river, you come back to the street side and it pops out from that experience. And the look on everybody's face is <laughs> priceless. It's not just the dinosaur bones and the geysers, it's like, holy, you know, blank. Uh, you know, so it worked pretty well. So here again is a, another overall shot of how that looks in the middle of the river over there. And from a storytelling perspective, Big Thunder actually helps anchor the story of the whole land yeah, and tie yeah. everything together, which had never been done. Because mm -hmm. we have a story about the guy that owns the Phantom Manor over there and made his money off of the gold that was taken from Big Thunder and um, so it's very consistent. It's a, it's, it's a town where John Wayne would feel comfortable walking through. <laughs> or John Stamos. Or John Stamos, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you can't have one John, you can get another one. And that's um, Mike Love of the Beach Boys. The dude, Uncle Jesse. Yeah, did you bring your slide of you performing with them? I actually got to perform with the Beach Boys about a month ago. They were into, I, I took John and his family around Universal, and yeah. we saw the show the night before, and they like shoved us all out. And, and John is a uber Disney. That you know, uh, Impact last summer had a 35th anniversary of, of the 33 Club, and uh, John was asked if he would host it, and he said, "I could do that. Um, could I be a member?" <laughs> and so, that was how he he got his membership. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. Uncle Jesse. He sent me that, and he says, guess where we are, you know? And then he put below it, this is my absolute favorite, favorite, favorite Big Thunder in the whole world, and um, I'm glad he thinks that, because I do too, you know? Um, and then one of my mentees, like I was to Claude, um, Dylan Olson, who worked for you guys, uh, we got married and they came over here, I think on their honeymoon, and uh, just shot this random picture from the Phantom Manor queue. And I said, that is stupendous, you know, that is just beautiful. So I wanted it here kind of as my final shot here of the most beautiful of all the Big Thunders. Now going from beautiful to something Ugly. slightly less so, <laughs> this was intended to be my gift to you. I got to work on the 2012, I think, enhancement of Big Thunder here in Florida. And we thought, wouldn't it be lovely to pay tribute to Tony? <laughs> so, Barnabas T. Bullion was born. We came up with this elaborate backstory for the, the head of the Big Thunder Mine. We worked in the, we actually uh, tied it back to the Discovery Bay story and the Society of Explorers and Adventures. And we thought, oh, we're gonna have a portrait and Tony's gonna be so flattered. <laughs> and our portrait artist, and this is actually the, the revision. The first one, you looked like a, a mad Donald Sutherland. <laughs> and Tony was like, I was so excited. He's like, why'd you make me the bad guy? And I'm like, you're not, you're not bad. You just, 
Well, I got badder because after they did this, and you know, it's well, that's, you that's and Kevin Feige's fault. Yeah, they, they decided. Marvel made you the bad guy. Yeah, Marvel decided it, this was really a great idea. So let's turn it into a series of comic books. And so they took that Barnabas character and made it the villain of this comic book. And so now I was really mad because I didn't think I looked like that, generally speaking. But then a friend of mine who worked on the comic book, while well, he was showing it to me in a restaurant, um, he goes, I'll let the picture speak for itself, you know, whether or not you look like that character. You could be a meme like Ben Affleck, like yeah. sad Tony looking at his comic. So, all right. So anyway, that was, I, I, I have trouble with seeing myself. As, you know, we could probably get you that portrait. Of yeah, I'm sure you could. Hang in the house. <laughs> it won't hang in my house. <laughs> I bet you John Stamos would like it. <laughs> You're probably right, or Brooke. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have something here for you. We can we pause it. Okay. Um, so this was done for the new Mickey shorts that became the, I guess, the inspiration for the Mickey's Runaway Railway at the studio tour. Uh, but I was looking through them, and we found this one, which is a tribute film by obviously someone who directed this who loved the original Nature's Wonderland at Disneyland and also loves Big Thunder. So it combines Mickey Mouse with uh, the Rainbow Caverns Mine Ray, right? And Big Thunder all into a three minute extravaganza here. And I think you'll enjoy it if you haven't seen it. Here's the, the tag end of that. I'll try to make it a little happier than it was, but uh, we were nearly finished in Paris, and at the part, it was a beautiful day in January, which doesn't happen often in Paris. And uh, I thought, I'll just call Claude. They knew I was in the hospital. I didn't know what it was. And uh, I got through to St. Joseph's, and uh, Alan, his son, was there. And he said, oh, they just took the breathing thing out so he can talk to you. And I said, well, I can hardly wait for you to come over. It's all because of you, and you were the one. And it looks great, and we can tell now it's going to be successful and whatnot. And uh, so you get out of the hospital, and we'll see you there. Well, in two weeks, he was gone. But I don't know what compelled me to make that phone call that day, but I think about it to this time that he knew it was good and that we felt it was devoted to his, you know, mentoring all of us along to be the second, the beginning of the second generation of Imagineers. And this was um, a, a tribute to all the things that clung to him. So even there in that rainbow camera, somebody put that in there because they loved what Claude did back when they were a kid, you know, at Disneyland. So um, that's my Claude story. Well, that's also a testament to just the, the lineage in this industry and obviously in the Disney parks in particular, from, from Claude to you and um, just Big Thunder alone is four different versions. Very loud. Uh, four different versions three continents, 40 some years, and uh, and now it's uh, in development as a feature film. It, it's Possibly, just- Possibly, yeah. And who can forget those comic books, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or kindly Barnabas T. Bullion. Yeah, right. Okay, so I don't know where we stand time-wise. We have about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Are there questions? Yeah, we could yes. do questions if that would be, um, if anyone has any. Okay, who's going to be the picker? Oh. You can be the picker, James. I'm the picker. You're the picker. I'm the decider. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They don't, then they don't hate me. You know, so. Thanks. As someone who, who started so young designing this ride, and then there it is, and you can, I don't see you wrote it, and it's in the Each time it was the same kind of thrill, and like, probably the one I had the least involvement with was Tokyo, which is kind of a clone of this one, and I mentioned Stick, Skip Lang, and Skip was over there with Pat Burke, and they pretty well, you know, that was the third one, and so he knew it really, really well, and it came out great, and it's got its own little flavor to it. Uh, but I did get to go over, and I brought some spray cans, because I had this idea of, of powdering the furthest butte so it looked like it was purplish, Purple Mountain's Majesty, you know, in the background. 
And the rules about taking spray cans on an airplane were so strict that I had to get these little tiny, you know, model kit. And it was ridiculous because when I got back and looked at what I had done, it was like nothing. It was just <laughs> But anyway, yeah, um, I think the most exciting was upping the ante in Paris, you know, where, okay, so that was 19, uh, 1992, and we, the first one was 79, and so it had been, hmm, figured that out, 79, 89, it was about 13 years. 13 years from between the first and the last. And uh, so you think, what is it that inspires you to do something for the fourth time? Um, making it incredible, you know? <laughs> and so like, when, when for the first rides on that, you just went, oh my God, Big Thunder is now in the, you know, pantheon of really great rides that were here. So that was probably the one that stands out. But I remember my mother in Florida, we coached, coaxed her into going on this thing. And, she slithered like an eel out from under the roll of the bar, and she was like a lump down on the floor. <laughs> and her friend, the lady friend, was in the seat behind, oh, 10 years older, and having a blast. And my mother was a pile of blob down on the floor. It was so embarrassing. But anyway, that was here at Walt Disney World. Yes. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw you were successful four times. Um, why is it not, did you push for it to be in Shanghai and Hong Kong as well, or what, what's the reason that, that you get to those two parks? I think changing of the guard, you know, it, it boils down to uh, everybody that comes into roles at, at Imagineering or Disney or wants a chance to do a new flavor, you know, and uh, I wrote the one in, in uh, um, Hong Kong, uh, I forget what the name of it is. Grizzly Peak, uh, Grizzly Peak or something. I, no, that's Disneyland. Uh, Grizzly Gulch. Yeah, and it's a good ride, but I'm not a fan of going backwards. So I have done, uh, I have done Everest several times by for, uh, being forced into it. <laughs> the, 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 the portion of the ride that goes backwards, maybe I think I did it twice in a row once, but normally once is enough for me on that, you know. So uh, Grizzly has some backwards, but it was easy. It was not as intense as um, the backwards portions of this, or, well, Hagrid's is okay too, I guess. Um, there's more a than okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it has backwards on it, right? It does. Yeah. So I caveat it that way. Okay. Yes. Um, with Paris, you were talking about originally Thunder Mesa. So in the Phantom Manor, you go through that ghost yeah. saloon town. Was that kind of an homage? Well, as uh, Jason said, we kind of homogenized the whole land to be more of a John Wayne frontier land because the subtleties of Kentucky, where Davy Crockett was, and all of that is sort of American, but not European. You know, they get all of those cliches that are so. So the idea of ending up in a ghost town with coyotes bailing at the moon and all of that, which has been re uh, beautifully uh, about two years ago. Because um, we never got to do it completely right when we opened, but they did a great job on the rehab on that one. But anyway, so everything from that to the Boot Hill Cemetery beyond it, um, and the look of the Phantom Manor over there is much more of a Western um, mansion, kind of a ghost town mansion. and so. The whole land, I think, plays off of that one thought, you know, and it was, it's kind of like how Marvel does movies, there's a Marvel universe, and I think Big Thunder is kind of the motivator for the universe of that frontier land. And even like when we opened Zorro, the black and white Disney Zorros were still huge on TV over there in 92, so we just got a guy, put a mask on him and a horse, they played that out of the night when the full moon and this guy comes riding out, and they do a rope trip thing with the guy falling off the building. And then the guy stood there for the rest of the night signing autographs. It was like, <laughs> it was amazing how many people came out for that. It was like a big deal, Zorro. And he fit perfectly into that uh, kind of dry, dusty frontier land look. Yes. Yeah, you.
Yeah, about a dozen of them. <laughs> yeah. There'll be a meal break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, that, that could be a whole evening talking about. I mean, the, the first thing I did to get the job was a Mary Poppins attraction, and then we did Discovery Bay, which had an aerial airship ride that you suspend, you were suspended looking down, kind of like what King Kong originally was at Universal, which was an upside down simulator. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> but we had the idea first, so somebody saw my idea. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so there are a lot of a lot of things that could have been. Well, Discovery Bay. Is yeah, kind of yeah. Bits and pieces elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you could elaborate on that. Well, <laughs> we, we dribbled it out across all of the, the United States. So the volcano in Tokyo Disney Sea is pretty much the centerpiece of what uh, Discovery Bay was all about, and that was also going to be for Disneyland or California's. Uh, Disney Sea that was in Long Beach, but then went to Tokyo, and then uh, in Paris we have the Airship Hyperion and the Nautilus, uh, which you can sometimes tour. But I've been hearing things tonight that it's been on permanent rehab for like a year, over a year, which is discouraging to hear because uh, it's beautiful. And it was one of the last things Tom Sherman, the reigning Nautilus guru, uh, supervised the construction of it, and it's, it's better than the walk through the real sets that was at, at Disneyland when Disneyland opened. Um, so yeah, uh, good ideas never die. So it just keeps, you know, little little bits of it come back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was your proudest moment through your whole Disney career? Oh, I think two. I think uh, it's this talk. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, I, I think Journey of Imagination, and, and we'll, we'll have this discussion tomorrow, but the opening show that lasted till around 2000 or 1999, uh, the kids that grew up with that, I know from what they tell me how much it meant to their life and how much figment still, the figment that's there doesn't generate the love of figment. The figment that they remember is what generates the love of figment. So that was bringing, I think, Disney to Epcot because if you remember, they weren't allowing characters to be in the park when it first opened. So we invented Figment to tell the story of how we all are imaginative. And I think it was an embracing show, which the current one is not, which says you're not imaginative, and if you smell a skunk and you hear a train, you'll become imaginative. So, um, I know, send the cards and letters. I don't know. I'm just, been, I can't be fired, I, I'm retired. You know, so. <laughs> anyway, um, to where, but the other one was the opening of Disneyland Paris. And Michael Eister had said, it's got to be distinguished in some way, and why don't you guys make the most beautiful park? And that made sense because the city of Paris is a city of light and love and art and beauty. And the challenge was how do you take a park that is easy to override what downtown Orlando is. Easier to override what 192 looks like. You know? <laughs> uh, and the same is true in Anaheim. You can, anything you do is better, right? So, um, but to go into Paris where on every corner is a masterpiece and be able to sit there and, and hold your head up proudly with that. And a, a land where Tom says there's 400 and some castles of, in France. And we have a castle, you know. There aren't too many here in Orlando, and there aren't too many in uh, Anaheim. But uh, it, it, it's now getting its due. This issue of Forbes magazine just came out and said something to the effect that it could be turned out to be Disney's wisest investment, including all the marbles and Star Wars and everything. You know, the way things are turning for it now, because it's our beachhead and one of the major markets of the world. So, and I think Mark, Mar uh, Michael, and Frank. Frank Wells and Michael Eisner uh, understood the importance of that, and they went through hell for the first 10 years because there was the biggest recession in all, of all time in Europe, and, and like the French who hated their Eiffel Tower and now find it the crown jewel of their culture, they hated Disney when it came over there because it was a, the American steamroller of pop culture. Uh, but we're past all that now. When I go back and I meet employees that work there, that are in their early 30s who say, my whole life 
revolved around this as a child and the fact that I'm here helping to make this a memory for the next generation. Well, that was not something we found there when we helped it. <laughs> you Americans, you think you own everything. <laughs> uh, so it's very exciting to go back there and they take care of it. And I can say this, you know, not only is it the most beautiful part, but the costumes there were designed by uh, a woman who worked on the movie The Ten Commandments. They are impeccable and they've maintained that. They haven't simplified them or anything. They're wool. It's cold enough that they can wear these kind of things over there and they're still dry cleaned and washed and uh, professionally. Uh, so there's just an aura about it that's very continental, I guess, but still Disney. Uh, and it has a dragon in it, which makes it different from every other castle in Europe. <laughs> I said, they go, how are we going to distinguish this? I said, well, you show me another one that's got a dragon living in the basement, and then we'll talk. You, know? well, and you were saying how management said, well, you're not going to get capacity. For yeah, that, that's just a thing you walk by. That's not capacity. Well, so, you know, you do these reviews to find out what the public thinks, and number one, Pirates of the Caribbean, number two, Big Thunder, number three, the dragon in the castle. So I said, I don't care if you don't count it for attendance or value, but it's the third favorite thing, you know. Now we have a few more rides over there, but that was opening day. And uh, it's still, I went in there and they keep him up really well. So uh, when I walked in there, I was worried, is he gonna be breathing smoke? Is he gonna move? And every time I go in there, he looks really good, so. All right. Yes. So, Big Thunder famously, supposedly, can uh, help you pass a kidney stone. <laughs> and my question is, to what extent, like, you, know, you kind of knew what it was all, all going to look like. To what extent did you know what it was going to feel like? Like, how, how much of that was planned? How much of that was, like, just kind of happy accident? I think at that stage, it was, um, I have gotten my job because I did a marble machine that allowed you know, they were actually steel ball bearings, but the size of a marble. And they rolled through all these tracks and they activated all this stuff. So I had no engineering training, but I had a sense of what gravity can do and what the limits of it are. And so when we were working with the very primitive computer programs to develop that track, um, the guy that was from the engineering side said, you've really got a sense about this. You're not that far off. You're maybe 100 feet too long, and we're going to have to shorten it to get enough energy to get to the next pickup point. But he said, it's amazingly close, you know. So um, I don't know that I knew the feeling of it, because the engineer can also then make that rougher if you turn the banking of the track so it doesn't cushion you. Uh, and sometimes we do that, and sometimes we don't. Like Indiana Jones, we deliberately, in California, make the ride go against the turns, so it feels like you're gonna fall out, you know, because that's more fun than if you're only going 15 miles an hour and you're feeling the curve the way a, a production car would do, you wanna go the opposite way. And there were a couple of mistakes in Big Thunder, but I think both the tracks have been reprofiled now. Uh, one was in the middle of the spiral Brute Butte where it suddenly it was, you were leaning in on a curve and then it shot out and then went back. And it was where the two alignment things from the computer met and were welded together. And I said, leave it, it's so perfect because everyone's locked in and then whoa, they kind of go this way and then back. But they finally, I think, took that out. And the other one was what I called the head knocker. Just after that, you kind of come up and then pop down into this cave and everybody's hands go in. You know? And that is still that way. I ride it and I go, I have got to put my hands in because I know I could get clipped there. But we had this amazing thing that had basketball like hands uh, with chalk on the end of them. And then if there were any chalk marks, you know, with this hand way up in the air for a eight, an eight footer guy, you know, um, then we had to knock the cement off, you know, to make it work. Um, but that one still to this day, when you get to that point in the ride, um, everybody goes down like this. <laughs> Got one more question? Okay. Um, yeah, because if you look at the rock work that we did for Galaxy's Edge, it's incredible. I mean, it's absolutely 
indistinguishable from reality, as is Cars Land, I think, at Disneyland, and we, we have two galaxy's edges, and they're both superb. And if I look at the chronology going back to 59, when they built the Matterhorn, it's really crude rock work compared to, it's, it's lovable rock work because it's my childhood rock work. And so I still look at it and it's, it's got a, you know, apparently it looks like your parents or something. And, but I look at it, if you go into the detail, you go, oh my God, that's so primitive. And then I see Big Thunder and kind of at a midpoint. And then I look at these new projects that they've done and they're just extraordinary as is a few over at your side of the parks. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, so I think going into it, you, you could be amazed by how realistic you could do it today with the computer technologies and everything. But I don't know if it was right for its moment in time, you know, and it's, the fact that it's still enjoyable today says that we put something in it that is um, everlasting, like Peter Pan. Um, the ride, Peter Pan, is still uh, generating crowds from 1971. Think about what films you still watch from 1971. There aren't very many because we've gone past that into a different realm. So trying to find these things, I said, for me, the, the biggest tool that I use when I start out on something is, okay, and I mentioned it earlier, why am I standing in line for the 20th time, waiting an hour, go on this, what is it about it that's compelling? And what that helps you do right away is stop from writing a book report of a movie or something. And I won't mention any Disney classic animation films that have created book report rhymes, but uh, they're kind of boring because they don't feature you. You are the star. And when Peter Pan at the start says, come on everybody, here we go, and you fly away out of that window, that is happening to you. And when we were on the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, you come seeking adventure with salty old pirates. You've come to the right place, and this happens to you. And you go into the Haunted Mansion, and you get an elevator, and no windows and no door and no way out. That's happening to you. So I think one of the things that's on Big Thunder, that's definitely an experience that's happening for and by and, and you, and, and not a third, a third person book report of, the old miner or the, the guy in the bathtub in the flash flood, uh, those are incidental to what's happening to you. And I think that's the perspective that needs to be in almost every classic Disney ride in order for it to survive from one cultural era in which it was created to the next. And that concludes the evening. Let's give a round of applause.